Patsy to Ferrets is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNX Media Network. So as most NFL teams are spending millions and millions of dollars and recruiting and pitching and trying to meet with free agents, I landed my top target this week, someone I have been chasing for weeks, good friend of the podcast, one of the people's favorite guests, Mike Giardi of the NFL Network is back to share some scoops. You and I, Han and Juju Smith-Schuster's trail yesterday that happened, the Patriots' biggest news of the week. Uh, but otherwise, how are you, buddy? I'm good, man. Busy, you know. Um, we'll be happy when this part of this calendar is over. And then, of course, we move on to the next part of the calendar, which, of course, is the draft. And then before you know it, we'll be sitting there on the hill. It'll be 90 degrees in training camp. And we'll be trying to figure out if this offense can score more than 31 touchdowns over 17 games. Don't, don't do this to me. Come on. The, the people are excited. We gave them some juice, some juju. And first of all, I'm excited about March Madness. I know you as uh, a league employee cannot bet in any sort of sports. I have multiple brackets. Spoiler alert, UConn is the last team standing, uh, which is a good time to remind the folks at home, as we have been, this episode of the Pats Interference Podcast brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive waging partner of the CLNS Media Network. If you sign up now at FanDuel.com, you get a $200 bonus. I'm using my $200 bonus uh, after putting down a $5 deposit, all on March Madness, free money to bet. It's going to be a ton of fun. But we have we have March. Like we even had the owners meetings. Okay, like are you going to be down in, in Arizona? There's a lot of stuff to go before the draft here. Yeah, look, I, I don't know. I don't know at that at this point if I'm going to be down there or not. Okay. Spent a it lot sounds of time like in Arizona already this year. I'm probably be fine not having to go there, but we'll see. Sounds like you don't want to go. <laughs> uh, that's fair. You've been extremely busy. I appreciate your time is always coming on here because you know I, I talk about hearing things occasionally that don't uh, come to light here in this podcast or whatever I'm writing for the Boston Herald because you want to get things confirmed. You hear so much more in and around the league and especially going to the combine as we both did. I don't want to talk too much about those rumors now because we have real agency signings to grade. We have real things about how the Patriots roster looks in comparison to everyone else in the AFC East, what we thought they'd do, what they've actually done, and then get to some mailback questions. But first, just your big picture you know, we're three plus days in here. Your reaction to what the Patriots have done in free agency is what? Uh, it's been fine. I, I think uh, Belichick always talks about the idea that there's so many different ways to build your team, right? There's trades, there's the draft, there's the waiver wire, and then there's this part of the calendar as well. So everyone's a little impatient. You want more to happen sooner. And of course, a few years ago, they gave you everything. Uh, spending an obscene amount of money uh, on some players that worked and some players that didn't. Um, they've clearly taken a different tack the last two years. And so it's you're sort of like, where's the next thing? Where's the next thing? But it, it's fine. I mean, I don't, I don't think they've dramatically altered their fortunes by what they've done here in the first few days of, of free agency. I, I think there's still a clear four in the pecking order. Well, they were three. I think they're a clear four with Aaron Rodgers going to the Jets. And there more needs to be done. There's a, there's a large there was a large gap between them and the Bills, um, and now there might be a large gap between them and the Bills, them and the Dolphins, and them and the Jets. So we'll see. Yeah, the word I would use is uh, underwhelming, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we could look at this and say it's business as usual, right? Because I wrote even for Monday in the Herald, you know, four things to know. One of which is, hey, Monday's going to be quiet. This is how they generally operate, except for 2021. You sit out the first wave when all the teams make the big mistakes. And then I'm sitting here in the same chair that Monday night going a lot of the same teams in the top 10 in terms of cash base did like the Patriots did in terms of waiting out these deals. More than half of them didn't make the proverbial splash. So it was a disciplined market where if that's how everyone else is acting, you're a, you're not zagging, but B you're not getting in the benefits of that discipline. Now, granted, most teams I don't think would have given Tremaine Edmonds four years, 72 million as close as he was to my heart the last month watching his tape or Mike McGlinchey getting 87 million over five years to go out to Denver. But I think when you look at this team, you know, it's business as usual. The Patriots are not as usual as they've been the last 25 years. We talked about it, 25 and 26 since Tom Brady left. You are top 10 in cap space again. You are bottom five, bottom seven in cash spending the last three years. They are still bottom five in cash spending this year, Mike Giardi. And they are projected currently to be dead last. That could change in 2024 because they're going to add more free agents and things like that. I just looked at the space the lack of cash spending, the urgency and the need in the pecking order in, in the division, I thought all of that would create this kind of wave of change. And instead, until Juju, they're sitting there like 
dipping their toes in the water, not even splashing around. Yeah, I guess the one concern I would have about their approach is continuing to think that they're the same franchise they were for the better part of 20 years when Tom Brady was your quarterback. And and it's different now. I think, you know, one of my tweets yesterday about Juju and Odell was about money matters now. And there was a period of time pre-2020 where it didn't, where you could get the veteran who wanted a ring and he looked at their situation and said, Belichick's the best coach of all time. Brady's the best quarterback of all time. And if I go there, yeah, maybe I sacrifice a couple million. Maybe I don't have as much fun. But the big fun is in the end when I win a championship and then someone overpays me next year because now I have the championship um, glow coming off of me. And that, and that happened so many times over the course of, you know, 16, 17 years. And to see them sort of approach it in a similar manner when now Mac Jones is your quarterback and you just had a just a complete a season full of disarray on the coaching staff and with players openly and privately speaking out about the way things are going. Yeah. It concerns me a little bit to think that you can still think you're this when in fact, I think the rest of the league looks at you like this. And um, I I mentioned at the beginning about the the difference in the AFC East. I mean, there are four. There's there's no, no question. There's no ifs, ands or buts about it. If we're just going based on the roster that's on the table, there are four. And again, there's months to go before we actually see them play a real football game. So there's plenty of time for them to alter this. But thus far, that's where they stand. And, um, yeah, I guess the, the word you used was underwhelming. It's definitely been underwhelming. All right, friendship check, Mike Jerry. Uh, because it's free agency and every 10 minutes I have a compulsion to check my phone if it's not flipped up. Mine is flipped down right now. Where, what is your phone, flipped up or flipped down? It's flipped down. Ooh, he passed. Yeah, Look at us. Going, you, no, I just, see, but now you just made me check. <laughs> All right. Well, the coast is clear for now. The other part about this is, you know, I, I don't want anyone to think that that we are mistaking activity for productivity, right? Like when they're making the big splashes in day one of free agency back in 2021, Nelson Aguilar, welcome aboard. John o. Smith, I was very wrong giving that contract an A minus in terms of grade, which is partly the folly of giving free agent grades, but also just saying, they had the worst tight end group in the league the previous two seasons. At least they got somebody. That's not how this works. You win the day, but you might lose the 364 that follow. And that's obviously what really counts. So I just think there were still opportunities to look at someone like Orlando Brown last night, late last night, four years, 64 million. Maybe there was a fit here and there. And part of free agency, even though it doesn't count, like I just said, is if you come close, that at least tells us, like Andre Dillard, for example, the Patriots tried to sign him. He goes to Tennessee anyway. And that shows you their interests. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? And you see their whole plan put together. So are are there any free agents you know besides those two? Because I think they had some interest in Orlando Brown, but Andre Dillard certainly that could tell us more of what they've been trying to plan. Anyone they came close to but didn't get as far as you've heard? No. No. Okay. So, and that again speaks to maybe a little bit of inactivity or a little bit of bar- a bargain basement shopping. I mean, look, they've, they've made phone calls on players that that are on other teams right now for trades. I mean, obviously we've, we've discussed sort of the, the wide receiver position and the Cortland Sutton, Jerry, Judy, those types, there's been phone calls made because that's doing your due diligence. Right. Every, but, everyone like, makes phone calls. And I, yeah. I don't say that to, to downplay any sort no. of reporting, but I've had people within the team being like, Hey, when you guys talk about, we got a call or we made a call. And if I get new information, I'm still going to share it. I'm just going to try to contextualize it. That means nothing. Okay. We all call right. about everything because as soon as you go like the one time, Hey, can I get to Andre Hopkins for a fourth? You're going to get hung up on. Yeah. Great. But the one time they say yes to something like that, you're really glad you made that call. Everyone makes calls. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're you're not doing your job if you're not making those calls. So they, they've done that, but I've gotten no sense that they're close on anything. You know, I, I've continued to mention Odell Beckham Jr. because there definitely has been a fling there over the course of time. Um, but the way he views himself as a player currently versus what I believe they view him internally, that's a massive gap. So... Um, maybe they feel a sense of desperation if some of the other things that they're trying to work on don't pan out. But generally, I don't think that's the way they operate. So um, I would be surprised if Odell Beckham Jr. ended up as a New England Patriot. I, I just, I think his 
his belief in what he is at this point versus what it really is. For, I mean, he basically hasn't played for like five years. <laughs> you start looking at the games played numbers. It's, it's pretty staggering. Um, but that's, that's really it. I mean, it's, they're operating in the shadows to a certain degree. Um, and maybe that benefits them at some point, but right now it's not benefiting the roster very much. Yeah. So it sounds like we're not missing anything then. And then when you look at their plan as a whole, clearly, I mean, you go back weeks now, re-signing guys like Connor McDermott, you know, I reported Carl Davis when he was coming back. Um, there's an emphasis on let's run it back with our current guys, which to me says we think we were better than we are and at least better than the media thinks we are because they could go. And this is the case they would make themselves. Hey, we were eight, nine last year. Our biggest issue is a self-inflicted wound with coaching. We've cleaned that mess up. Bill O'Brien's here. Adrian Clem's here. Bill's out of the way. As far as the offense goes, Mac is going to be better. It'll have a trickle down effect. We built up our depth in the offensive line. So when we're, you know, having Isaiah win, throwing a bleat fit for playing right tackle, and then he's not playing well, and then we have to go to Yadi Kajus, and he's not going great. We don't have to go to literal street to sign Connor McDermott. We've at least got adults in the room, capable tackles here, whether it's Riley Reef bringing back McDermott, uh, Calvin Anderson's here now. Like, all of this combined will take us to a competency level where, you know, that little secret sauce we used to believe and folks did about our franchise will put us over the edge in close games. I would say you need more than a little bit of secret sauce against Aaron Rodgers. OK, against Josh Allen in the pieces they brought back in Buffalo and Miami, which is just I would love to see their cap sheet next year. No one wants to hear about this. We shouldn't talk about it. But good Lord, adding people like Jalen Ramsey, even David Long, great signing for them, a linebacker. You need to make a bigger jump. But it, it seems to me that they're still very confident in the roster that they have because that's all they've done, including the free agent tenders, restricted free agency. They brought nine people back and only signed four on the outside. Well, once again, they have a really nice middle class. Okay. But in the past, when they had that really nice middle class, they also had Tom Brady. Yeah. And maybe Rob Gronkowski or Julian, who was the perfect fit. Julian Edelman was a perfect fit for what they did. Uh, they bring in a Stefan Gilmore to get elite corner play. Darrell Rivas before that. Um, so there was high-end pieces on the roster. And when you look at this roster, I ask you, what are the high-end pieces? Can you, do they have a high-end and Ramondre? Maybe, right? I mean, it's running back, so there's. I'm not an anti-running back ite, but <laughs> there's only so much they can do to influence the game. So he's their best playmaker. Is that good enough to have your running a, a big, strong running back be your best playmaker? That that concerns me. Well, we um, saw what that looked like last year, right? He had right. more receptions than anyone yeah. on the team, more than Jacoby Myers, more than Devontae Parker, more than Kendrick Bourne, and obviously led them in rushing. And teams just knew it was coming. If you have a fast linebacker, he's a good receiver, but he's making you miss after the catch, not necessarily yeah. at the line, especially the way that teams like Buffalo kind of crowded him when they were playing press coverage. Right. Well, Andrew, I, I just go back to some of the conversations I had at the combine with defensive coordinators, and I know I tweeted them out Um and the, the gist was like, they didn't have anybody, especially on the outside that we feared and they didn't do anything or have anyone to influence us to say, well, we can't do that against them. Everything that teams went into or they had done all year long defensively, they didn't say, oh, we got to take that off the table because they'll, they'll hurt us if we try to do that. We, the people I talked to said that that was never an issue that nothing had to be taken off the table. And to your point about feeling like internally, they feel like they've gotten better because they've cleaned up their coaching staff. Okay, fine. You know, that was one of the conversations I had too, where it was like, if they had done something that we hadn't planned for, we were able to solve the problem quickly. And then there was no, they had no counter to our counter, to our response. Right. And you would expect with Bill O'Brien and his long history of calling plays and building an offense, that he would have a counter for their counter. Okay, that's great. But again, you're countering their counter with <laughs> C plus players, yeah. B minus players. So it's not as if I can scheme this up and now, oh, well, now I figured out a way to get Rob Gronkowski solo on that middle linebacker who can't run like he can and is giving up four mm -hmm. inches and 40 pounds. Like, no, they don't have that guy currently on their roster. So, um, 
that feels a little bit like hubris to me. Like, and again, what's the end game? Like, okay, you were eight and nine. You felt like you self-inflicted wounds. I had people tell me they thought they should have had definitively should have had two more wins last year. Okay. So you're 10 and seven. What's it get you? I mean, it gets built closer to the record. It gets you in a playoff game. I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't even think. Does it get you a home playoff game? Doesn't get you a home playoff game, I don't think. So, like, you're not getting a home playoff date. I just – every year you're not going to win the championship, and we were spoiled here because for the better part of that run, they were always in the mix. If they weren't in the Super Bowl, they were in the AFC title game, and heaven forbid they lose a round earlier, like the sky was falling. Um, now they're 25 and 26. The one playoff game they got in the last three years, they got absolutely smoked and their division has gotten better and maybe they've gotten better, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a very small, it's a finite uh, improvement. And that's, I, I just, I don't know what you're, I don't know what the end game is. It, and I know people listening to this right now, just as someone who, you know, is a fan of other teams and listens to people go, what the hell is that front office doing? Or what is that coach doing? And get like a little angst about, Back off, okay? And their response would be, hey, Mike and Andrew, it's Thursday. Technically day two of free agency, even though this is really day four. We don't know what else they're going to do. They had their highest draft pick since 2008 when they get Gerard Mayo. That's a real asset that you could flip in a trade. Or you take a player who could start day one at receiver, offensive tackle. You know, again, you build up more of these depth pieces. It was a top five defense. You started a ton of rookies on special teams. Those things will change around or stay the same, hopefully, in terms of the defense. Mac plays his best season because he just needs to. Uh, and, and again, you're contending. I would just say that, of course, it's Thursday. Of course, we're day four of free yeah, agency. We said but it this- early, though. I liked, You have to – this is the thing with uh, – especially, I think, with Pats fans, but by, I guess in general, by and large, across the board with fans, like, we know it. We said it already. We've already couched it. We know it's Thursday. There's yeah. still months, we've said multiple times – to build the team. But in this moment, when we're doing this podcast, this is what it looks like. And this is what everybody else either has done or has maintained. The bills would be a perfect example of basically maintaining what they've had. And you're not really any closer to catching them and beating them than you were when the process started. Right. Whatever, three days ago. And and that's exactly where I was headed is a, hey, this is the only thing we can deal with the here and now. Like I, I was tweeting about, they lose Jacoby Myers, any trade talks about DeAndre Hopkins or Jared Judy got a lot more difficult because everyone's looking at you bottom five skill position groups going, Oh, you wanted Hopkins for a third. Okay. Now it's a third and a third next year, you know, because that leverage changes in those conversations, sure. but Juju gets here. They're going to make more moves. I would just say, again, it's been underwhelming. You have the resources. You have not spent those resources recently. You are ranking in very small market teams in total total cash spend, which matters as much as the cap. And they're doing well in both of those areas. Where they're not doing well is the same thing you just said in terms of blue chip talent. Who scares you? Who keeps coaches up at night? Defensively now, okay, Kyle Duggar, Judon, Uche, when they get to third down and even then still kind of a speed-based player, there's a long way to go. We're going to hear that. They're going to tell you that. I just think... Their edges as far as quarterback and coach are the only thing they had over teams like the Jets last year. That edge and quarterback are certainly gone. So now you're dead last in the division. I don't care what division you're in. If you're dead last, you're going nowhere in the NFL. Um, Let's get to some grades, shall we? Yes. Okay. Before that, quick message for the folks at home. You've heard me say this before. But listen up, if you have not been barred enough by ads from people with sports books and betting already in Massachusetts, you've got one more coming because FanDuel – America's number one sports book is now live in Massachusetts. If you are in Massachusetts and don't have a FanDuel account, listen up very closely because you can get into the action with $200 in bonus bets. Guaranteed when you place just a $5 bet at FanDuel.com slash Boston. The link is in my episode page on Spotify and Apple. Click there. It'll take five minutes to get you where you need to go. You can bet on the Pats, their draft the Sox, the Celtics, the Bruins. Bruins were losing 2-0 the other day. I put down a $5 bet, came back with 20 when they beat the uh, Red Wings uh, last Sunday. So go to the app. It's the easiest app you can find in any sort of sports book moving forward. Visit fanduelcom slash Boston. Make every moment more on America's number one sports book. Must be 21 or older in present Massachusetts. First online bet, uh, real money wager only. Just $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued 
As non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days, restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Hope is here. Gamblinghelpma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. Okay. Juju Smith-Schuster. Taylor Rapp is visiting the Patriots today. Safe to free safety. Versatile player, but a free safety, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. A little small. Uh, yeah. Washington kid. Um, get a little background on him. We'll have him next episode, TBD. Juju Smith-Schuster, though. Biggest name, probably, as we look at the remaining free agents, including Taylor Rapp, available, will probably headline this class. He gets a three-year, $25.5 million deal in terms of base value. 16 of that is guaranteed. It's incentive heavy in 24 and 2025, which takes a max value to $33 million. I had many thoughts on this, but let's just start with Mike Giardi's grade, and then we'll get into the comparisons to obviously Jacoby Myers' contract, which was also in the overall structure, three years and $33 million, and why the Patriots chose Juju pretty much straight up over Jacoby. It's a B minus B. I'm kind of like, he's, he's a good player. He brings an element of physicality after catch that Jacoby didn't. Um, he's also been with two players, coaches, and Mike Tomlin and Andy Reid, who were fine eventually walking away from what was on the table or what was being presented to maintain the player. So I think that's something to sort of keep in mind. Uh, and I know in, in my conversations with people that, uh, the Chiefs were not even close to where the Patriots were in terms of money, and they just had the player in the building. So, um, again, I think it's it's fine. It's he's 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 a serviceable player. Like I wouldn't be surprised, depending on what happens at the receiver position going forward here, if he is the primary option and ends up catching close to 100 passes if he stays healthy. There's another issue. 21 games over the last two years, uh, dealt with the knee, pretty much cost him his final season with Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, it was a real struggle for him. And then last year, near the end of the year, I want to say the final five or six weeks, they had to manage him quite a bit because of that knee. So something, again, to keep in mind, I, I, I think some Pats fans are looking at this and saying they're seeing the guy in year two who with the Steelers had whatever it was, 100 catches, 1400 yards and uh, I think they remember making an explosive play against the Patriots and think that's the guy they're getting um, based on the way he's been handled physically the last two years I don't think that's the player you're getting but again you're still getting a good player and in some ways yes it's a physical upgrade from Jacoby I would say on that front the devil you know versus the devil you don't and you know the player, the player knows the system. He's got a good relationship with the quarterback. The quarterback leaned on him quite a bit. What 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 message are you sending to the quarterback again? Because now he's on his third offensive coordinator in three years, which is, by the way, the handbook to ruin any young quarterback. And now you're constantly swipping, uh, swapping out pieces that he likes. So uh, I, I think you just kind of have to put it all into the big picture. It's not just about the player but how the player fits, who the player's replacing, and what does it say overall? And that's why I kind of put it, I give it a number grade. It's like an 83. We're kind of like hovering right around there. Yeah, BB minus. Okay. I don't care so much about the Mac stuff. I just don't think he's been good enough to kind of command or have much of an input in the way that, you know, the top five quarterbacks might, or the contract quarterbacks were going to be for eight, 10 years, like NBA superstars do when they're involved in roster building. It's nice that a couple of years ago, Patrick Mahomes wanted Clyde Edwards Hilaire at the end of the first round and the chiefs took him. Um, I don't know how well that pick has worked out. The other point is the Patriots just need more receiving talent. Like, again, this is a bottom five skill position group in the window between Jacoby Myers leaving Juju Smith Schuster getting here. I don't think they're any higher or outside of, you know, the bottom 10, maybe bottom eight right now. Yeah. And I have good things coming about Juju Smith-Schuster, who off the top, as you mentioned, has already proven to have a higher ceiling than Jacoby Myers. Okay, this is change. And what I'm on the record saying multiple times on TV, on this podcast, and in writing, is that the Patriots need some sort of shakeup, okay? You cannot run it back and say, we're better than you think we are. Let us prove it to you. Because doing that has been 25 and 26 record the last three years. Juju has changed, okay? He's had a 1,400-yard season. 111 catches, seven touchdowns with Pittsburgh. The problem is 
that was 2018. As you mentioned, his yeah. year last year in Kansas City, close to 1,000 yards, their second leading receiver in every category, basically behind Travis Kelsey, was his best season since then. So the Patriots are buying high. They're buying high in an asset that was just in an environment incredibly conducive to that type of production, Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid. And we've done this before. The Nelson Aguilar comparison was one that I drew an article on the Herald and that Aguilar was coming off of an environment in Vegas where John Gruden's an offensive head coach. Derek Ball is one of the best deep ball throwers we have in the league. Say what you will about him becoming a pee puddle under pressure. But they unleash Aguilar as just... He ran more go routes, I think, than almost anyone in the league that year in 2020 and cashed in big time. When he comes to this offense, a different offense, his stock crashed because that's what happens when you buy a high. Now, Juju's fit in New England is a much smoother projection, right? Like he's a big slot. He's going to do what Jacoby did. You look at their numbers over the middle of the field where primarily he's going to work and they were basically identical. Okay, so it was 9.6 yards. Uh, per catch for Jacoby Myers, 9.7 for Juju. Their catch rates were between 73 and 77% on passes over the middle of the field. Great. The issue is, again, in an on-field sense, while Juju offers you maybe a little bit higher ceiling in terms of yards after the catch, which all of my colleagues have written about and I did too, he does that against zone coverage. And the Patriots' biggest problem on offense, even dating back to Tom Brady's last two years, has been facing and beating man-to-man. And objectively, Juju is a worse player against man coverage than Jacoby Myers was. Again, if he gets loose, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's probably a little bit faster. That dynamicism has been missing from this offense. He brings an element that maybe only Kendrick Bourne can after the catch creating offense. It's just that you were doing okay versus zone. Your issues were against bump and run, and that's not an issue that you solve with Juju Smith-Schuster, who also has had his most successful seasons, 2018, even 2017 as a rookie, and now 2022, working opposite a four-time All-Pro. That was Antonio Brown in Pittsburgh. That was Travis Kelsey in Kansas City. What does he do now? Again, this could change as the number one target when you're facing Jalen Ramsey and Xavier Howard, Jadavius White, and Sauce Gardner, all in the division each twice a year. I don't know. Maybe he'll be fine. Maybe he'll have his best season yet. I just look at his numbers and his production and the timing of this investment which financially is fine. It's, it's, I think, a better deal than the one that Jacoby Myers got in Vegas, okay? All the guarantees in the first two years, a lot of incentives good for them. I just think they needed more. This is a little bit of change. I give this a B minus because, again, I think at some point you just have to bet on the upside. But besides from just, okay, he's going to fit, but can we count on getting the best version of Juju Smith-Schuster right now with the timing of this deal, knowing that he's locked in for a couple of years and is going to be your number one option in a new environment? that uh, it's going to be a little less friendly than Andy Reid's hamburgers and Patrick Mahomes throwing off his back foot was going to be. I have my doubts, but as far as the financial risk and the quality of the player, I think a small upgrade over Jacoby possibly, but you also have a lower floor and that might be the more likely set of outcomes that we get than if you would just run it back with Jacoby. And here's the last thing I'll say, because I've been talking too long. You could have brought both of them back. Not a problem. In terms of cash spent, Cap space, push it forward. Jacoby's market, way underwhelmed projections. Some that you had, some at ESPN, mm-hmm. just estimations on my own behalf. I owed 50 push-ups to an agent, which we had some <laughs> a bet on what he would get. Fell well short. That happened. They knocked out. I just look at this, and I wonder why not both. And it might have been injury-related. People mentioned Jacoby's knee to me, the small Terry had last year. Maybe that was it. Maybe it wasn't. But you need more receiving talent that hasn't changed. This is no okay case start. If I came home with a B minus back in the day, my parents would say, okay. Hmm. Myers played 31 games in the last two years. Juju, I think 21. Is that my, my, I think my math is correct. You said 21 like 10 minutes ago. So you can't go back on it now, even if it's wrong, but yes, we'll look this up. We'll have research. I feel pretty good about that. So, you know, people can say his knee was a problem, but he was on the field versus the other guy whose knee was a problem and wasn't on the field. I, I just, again, it's, even if the, he has a higher ceiling, it's still to me a one for one trade. Yes. The percentage points that you improved at that position, if you get the max from the player, is what? 5%, 7%. Like, you know what I mean? It's, I did, it's a small push of the needle. There needs to be more done there if they're going to be someone that can compete with the other teams. As I mentioned on TV yesterday, it's Josh Allen to Stefan Diggs. 
It's Aaron Rodgers to Garrett Wilson. It's um, Tua to Tyreek and Jalen Waddell. And it's Mack to right now his best receiver is Juju Smith-Schuster. All right. That's an L. That's an L. Let's uh let's pick the people up here a little bit because yeah, we're, right. we're gonna straight go. shoot, we're gonna be honest, but you gotta keep the positivity going if you want people hanging on the other end. Uh Riley Reef, I thought this was a great deal for the Patriots. I do not expect him to start as supposedly the Patriots do, according to our friend Jeff Howe, the athletic. I think that is a foolish expectation, and probably them, you know, putting on a front possibly when they go ahead and take Darnell Wright or Broderick Jones in the first round of the NFL draft. But until then, Riley Reef at the very least, for one year, $5 million, is an excellent swing tackle. Guy who's played left tackle and right tackle, extraordinary locker room presence, leader. He's durable. Like He's going to fit right into New England. No questions about fit. Not someone you want starting for a contender. But again, that's not where the Patriots expect to be and not what they need. If you have someone better ahead of him, someone he can help develop you know, or show the ropes to, because honestly, they're not, except for David Andrews, many leaders of that ilk, in that room, you know, let alone with a first year offensive line coach, Riley Reef is the exact presence you need for the Patriots in this offensive line and potentially the player who can jump in in a pinch and play left or right tackle for that kind of money. One year, no problems here. B plus, A minus. I'm, I'm with you completely. Uh, talking to people in Chicago, uh, they felt like he was uh, a critical look. They didn't have a great season, but they felt like he played at a pretty good level. In fact, I, the word resurgence was used to me last year. He was terrific as a run blocker. To your point, they had so many problems to tackle last year. You end up playing, signing and playing Connor McDermott off the street, like what, eight days after you signed him, something ridiculous. Yeah. Um, if Riley is healthy, the, the ability to bounce between left and right tackle, Hey, my left tackle's down for two games. Okay. Well, it's not ideal, but he's not going to absolutely destroy us. Um, we can plug him in and we can still run most of our offense. I think that's important. I think they, they lived too much of that last year where, you know, for all the other problems that just, you know, that was another log on the fire of like, Oh God, we can't do this because we're playing this dude. We had to sign off the street or because Isaiah Wynn just couldn't get his head out of his hind quarters. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a perfectly good signing. Again, nothing that, moves the needle, changes where you are as a franchise, but does give you a, a more competent uh, backup and a, a slot spot starter, you know, that they, they didn't, they, they were, they were struggling for last year. Yeah. I think he goes in the same category as Calvin Anderson, who's been, you know, more of a left tackle than a right tackle a little bit earlier in his career um, who their first free agent signing out of Denver. I don't know. I don't want to do complete grades on him because I watched a little bit of Riley Reef yesterday dug into some of his numbers. We've watched him at some point over his career. I've not studied any Calvin Anderson tape, but you can put them in the same boat, right? Like these are guys who project the swing tackles back up. Maybe you get lucky and, you know, one swings up into the higher end of their season outcomes and starts. And that's great. And you get 10 games out of them. Um, but I think the Patriots patting their depth at offensive tackle is smart. You still just need the higher end long-term starter there because virtually nobody's under contract in 2024 out of this group. Um, so let's go to the most recent signing running back James Robinson. This surprised me late last night, two years, $8 million max. We don't know the particulars in terms of the guarantees. He was not tendered by the jets who traded for him mid season just last year. That is a red flag for me. Robinson though is still early enough in his career where he's just 24 undrafted free agent rushes for a thousand yards in Jacksonville starts the next year, falls just short of a thousand yards. Third year, obviously, as I just said, gets traded. He's five foot nine, 219 pounds, soft hands, very good receiver. Has not graded out particularly well as a pass blocker, which I thought they needed. You're more bona fide third down back. It doesn't need to look like James White or Shane Vereen or Kevin Falk. But, you know, neither did Ramondre Stevenson, and that worked out fine. It was just that Stevenson was playing first down and second down in addition to third. The light and the load here with Robinson. I probably would have preferred a Samaji Pirine who got a similar deal out in Denver. Jamal Williams is going for about $4 million per year with the Saints. Proven pass catchers, proven pass blockers, good veteran locker room guys. Instead, you get a 24-year-old who might offer the upside like he showed in his rookie year, or he's already wearing down because the Jets not even tendering him as a restricted free agent was a big red flag for me. Yeah, I mean, the Jets were desperate when Brees Hall went down, and when they made that trade, it was like, ooh, that's – 
you know, that's about as good as you can do in season. It was a, swing. a piece like this and um, made zero impact and ended up not even dressing uh, for a good portion of the time. And, you know, some people opine because it was a, is it going to be, it was a conditional pick. Was it going to be a fifth or a sixth or a fifth or a fourth? I forget which, but regardless, you know, did they keep him off the field because of that? I think they kept him off the field because they deemed him not as good as the other guys that they had. Uh, and that was a team that was at one point in the playoffs, you know, at seven and four, I think they were at one point. And then just the season tanked after that, but um, he couldn't get on the field. So yeah, surprised by it, surprised as well, because you drafted two running backs last year in Strong and Harris, which I think we all assumed was the uh, Damian Harris replacement package, um, knowing that he was going to go into free agency this year. Um, so what does that say about their development? Um, yeah, I don't, this one does not, doesn't do a lot for me. C plus, I, I would guess is where I'd put it. And again, I guess you're, like you said, if you, if he is able to rewind and be the player he was a couple of years ago, I mean, he's not going to get that, that's a significant an opportunity here because he's playing behind Ramondre, but if he gives you that same kind of jolt, then that grade can go up. But right now it just seems like a curious decision to me based on what you drafted last year. And now, once again, are you telling us guys that you drafted to fill roles much like you did with the tight ends and Asiasi and Keen a few years ago, are they just not, are they just not good enough? Are they just not NFL players? Yeah. I, um, I'm going to go with a B minus. And I, honestly, I, I think I ended on a B minus with Juju. I'm, I'm going to give that a solid B just in terms of the money. Like, again, my expectations are not that he'll replicate what he did in Kansas City, but financial risk is lower. It's some change, et cetera. And I feel better about that move with Juju, even at that money, than James Robinson, where, again, the details are important. Like, the initial figures are always bloated. That's It's part of the game, but we everyone's kind of come around to that where even if those are the numbers given, report it, clarify this is maximum value, not just the base. Um that this is fine. However, the guarantees shake out. I think the Patriots buying low on James Robinson, even though I just said this is a red flag from the Jets, is probably smart because I think you want to buy low on players like this, uh, like the Raiders did in 2020 with Nelson Aguilar and the Chiefs just did with Juju Smith-Schuster and you get you know the bounce back. There's definitely potential for that here. I just think, again, there were better fits, more proven veterans. It will be interesting to see what they think of Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris. And we address this in the mailbox upcoming Spoiler for me about, oh, I thought this was the plan. What's going on? Fourth and sixth round picks, okay? Like, A, a you got in the building. Nothing after that is promised. Fourth round picks get cut after their first training camp all the time. These guys stuck it out. But maybe the Patriots aren't necessarily all in on what they saw from their first years from Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris. And maybe they'll be surprised as they were certainly with James White in 2014 when people thought he would get cut. He stuck around. He's going to go on the Patriots Hall of Fame. James Robinson, I don't think he's going to the Patriots Hall of Fame. But I think for now... He can go into the B minus, throw him in the bin. That's fine. Last one I want to do with you. Uh, we can speak to him most certainly from a financial standpoint, uh, as a player, in terms of his fit. Just a good guy. Jonathan Jones, two years, $19 million, $13 million of that is guaranteed. Your reaction is and was what? There was more money out there for him if he wanted it. Um, so it speaks to the loyalty um, and the comfort level that he had with the Patriots organization wanting to continue to stay here. Um, yeah, he's he did, he's done everything they've ever asked him. The classic success story, right? The undrafted free agent. We'll give him some special teams. How it works there. Let's give him a little bit of defense. How that works. Let's give him a little bit more defense. Hey, this kid's pretty good. Now he's your slot guy. He gets a second contract. He proves to be one of the better slot guys in the league. And then last year you looked at your corner situation and you're like, He's our best guy. So we got to move him outside. And it's not ideal. He's not, I think he's listed at 5'10. That's not even Generous. remotely close. That's not close to being true. I'm pretty sure I'm taller than him. I was going to um, say, do you know anything about that? Yeah. So, Speaking from experience. Yeah. So, um, but any, I thought he acquitted himself well. Like, look, he can't cover Justin Jefferson. Guess what? Nobody can. So, um, you know, there's four or five guys in the league that I'd feel pretty good if I had to line them up against Justin Jefferson and say, we, we might be able to fight this one to a draw. He might not go for 10 and 150 against us and score two touchdowns. John's not that guy, but John is a competitive guy. He played well. He's a leader. I think Devin McCourty spoke about you know him and Jacoby Myers as being guys that could step in and fill the leadership void uh, with him gone. I, it, it's a, to me, it's like an A minus signing. Like he just, 
Hey, if you, I mean, like, he's just, you know what he is? I think he still has good football left in him. He's tough. He's all the things you want. Uh, you got to be, and I, I would hope that he gets to be able to be moved back inside. Although, again, with Miles Bryan signing the RFA and then um, with Marcus Jones on the roster, maybe he stays outside. But uh, I, I still think his best, his best slot is on the inside as the corner. I agree, which I talked last week about Phil Perry, uh, your mortal enemy and, you know, just longtime Can't nemesis. Him. He's a terrible human being. Yeah. And, I, you know, his sense was that he would come back and Phil was spot on about that. And part of it was the small media tour that Jonathan Jones did saying, I'd love yep. to stay in New England, which undercut his leverage. And lo and behold, they got him for less than what he could have got, as you reported, on the open market. Phil's other point was it just felt redundant with, you know, if Marcus Jones has obviously come back in the next few years. He was maybe their best draft pick last year mm -hmm. he's only really going to play the slot is a nickel at five foot eight and he tried to compete and got out work and that just happens when you're five foot eight in the outside but he could absolutely make a long living as your nickelback jonathan jones obviously that's his best foot too now his contract makes him the 30th highest paid corner by total value 21st by average annual value if he's a top 20 corner in the league next year not outside the realm of possibility excellent value for the patriots if he's the 30th so you're a borderline one and two, which I think is the high end of his play. And we saw that in the first half of last year. Mm -hmm. Boom, you get your value too. And where Jonathan Jones is really going to help, and I talked about this in my last episode, so I'm not going to belabor the point. We'll get to the mailbag. Is he's just a utility guy across your entire secondary. Instead of paying three different people, one year, three million, one year, four and a half to be, you know, your third safety, you know, your fourth corner, contribute on special teams. This one guy does it all. So when you have an injury, somewhere else he can fill in like that and he's only really had one serious injury over his career which is remarkable considering again he came in in 2016 as an undrafted free agent he is also now the most experienced player on bill belichick's defense that matters a lot he could also replace mccordy potentially long time as the free safety he's got the speed he's got the smarts he's got the experience i, I he's not a blue chip player but he's someone that the patriots got at the number they wanted and i think we'll have surplus value barring i don't know he picks up like a drug habit or just doesn't show up to work like he's as yeah. rock solid as they come and those are the type of people they need in their locker room and the performance is is you know i talk about range of outcomes and juju could be you know crashing and burning or, or another 1200 1400 yard season jonathan jones's outcomes are very small and they're all in a very good range so yeah i'm with you i think this is a b plus yeah, not, really not, a, not a great deal for the Patriots, but like this is the business you want to try to do for them. Yeah, this is the business I think we kind of all thought they might do with Jacoby Myers and, and they didn't. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I he's he's a good player. Yeah, I, I can't I say it to people a lot, too. Like he brings a level of physicality at his size that that's rare. Like he has no fear of running into significantly bigger human beings and doing it with violence. And I, and I appreciate that. And to your, the, the one injury it's it's really remarkable because he does play uh, with sort of a, a recklessness when he attacks a ball carrier and whatever's in front of him. And that's, uh, that's someone that you hope Jack Jones and Marcus Jones are watching and saying, well, if he can do it, so can I. Yeah. And he, I haven't talked to Jonathan about this, but I would imagine, you know, again, undrafted kid didn't have this decorated college career though it seems like he's going back to Auburn every single offseason and they should welcome him with open arms as they do um that you remember what it was like going I might need to find another job in that spring of 2016 if this football thing doesn't work out and comes and brings it with that level of ferocity and that kind of fear in the back of his head of you know if I don't do this I'll be out of the league that's of course silly now given he just got 13 freaking million dollars guaranteed <laughs> right. more money than you and I might might ever see but that's also what makes players like him great in this process really work out and players, you know, to, to cash in, which is, you know, for my money, um, the best part of free agency is seeing that rewarded. But uh, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's no interest or very little, as it seems, with Jacoby Myers. But moving on to the mailbag, um, this question comes from Gary. He wants to know what happened between the team, hmm. Mike Jardy. And Damian Harris, the team had nothing but good things to say after Damian was drafted. He played a lot over the last three seasons, parentheses, went healthy. I assume they want him back. I don't know how Gary fit this all in a tweet. Um, to compliment Stevenson, yes, what was that retweet about? Now, background, he retweeted Darius Slay, um, who was also quote tweeting 
uh, I want to say Trey Diggs Qu- regarding Diggs. something Josh McDaniels had done. Like you yeah. can see the layers and the little Russian dolls of just Twitter stupidity yeah. as I unravel these. But the point is he retweeted Darius Slay, who has an issue with Matt Patricia, which came up again when someone else had an issue with, quote, the Patriot way. Damian Harris retweeting something like that. Not great. I go back to the first question. What happened? I think it's the Matt Patricia, Joe Judge thing. I think it's pretty simple. Didn't like uh, didn't like the offense last year. Didn't like a lot that happened last year. And it sort of um, speaks to the erosion of confidence that so many of the offensive players had. I would also say that Damien should stay off the internet. I don't think it's really smart to jump into those sorts of things, but he did. And um, I guess he could claim that he accidentally liked it or retweeted it, <laughs> um, which I think seems we're to past be that the, in 2020. Yeah, which but... seems to be, but usually generally you, f- you figure that out pretty quickly. I've done that a few times where I accidentally hit a, a heart and then I'm like, wait, why is that on my phone? Get that off there. No way. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I just, and also like, Hey, look, he, Damien believes he's a one and they believe that Ramondre is the one and that that's, you know, player has pride, thinks that he's a better player than maybe he's getting credit for and thinks he's deserved more snaps. And I would say hard, hard time staying on the field at various points as well. So to me, this was all coming anyway. I, I don't think that Damian Harris could have done pretty much anything this past season that would have prevented him from drifting off into free agency. I just think that that was the, that was the plan. And short of him taking an incredible discount to stay, that he was as good as gone to begin with. Yeah, I'm with you. I think this is how it was always going to uh, play out with Damian Harris. I think you also look at him, you know, it was evident to me that Ramondre Stevenson, by the end of 2021, his rookie year was a better player than Damian Harris, more dynamic. Patriots obviously fed him a ton last season. Damian's been teamed up. He's also really been a one phase player. And unless you're a number one, like a receiver or a running back, you got to contribute on special teams. And he wasn't doing that. I don't know if he wasn't willing to do that or it was something that they just didn't see him as a fit. But regardless, Patriots aren't going to keep those players around. And honestly, giving running back second contracts isn't the best business you can do uh, in the league. The last thing I'll, I'll add is I think there are, are people split in the building. This probably goes for everyone. Like this goes for anyone who works in any sort of workplace who will miss Damon Harris. And there are others that I know will not. And so sometimes when you need a tiebreaker, um, it just comes down to, you know, did you enjoy working with that person or having that person uh, work for you? So that comes up. Uh, he'll move on elsewhere. I think he's still got a lot of good football left ahead of him and um, hope he succeeds. So, Gary, that's what happened. Jordan wants to know, quote, there, it's not even a question. Uh, well, there's a question mark. There's no way they're planning on starting Reef slash Anderson slash McDermott at right tackle, Right. No, we as of right now, one of those guys is starting at right tackle. Now we'll see what they do in the draft. Uh, you mentioned Wright, who has sort of um, climbed up the draft charts as someone who, who would be right around where they're picking. Maybe could maybe even slide back a few spots, pick up another asset and maybe get him at least at this point and some of the projections I've seen. Um, but as of right now, yeah, one of those guys is starting. Uh, again, as we said many times, aggregators at home, uh, we know there's still a long way to go between now and the start of the regular season. Yeah, still well, those, those people are definitely not listening anymore um, if, <laughs> if, if they're mad at you Bastards. and I. But, uh, yeah, I agree. As of right now, I think the Patriots could somewhat reasonably roll the dice saying, okay, we'll throw all these guys at the ball, see who sticks. They've done that in many positions, and it's mm-hmm. a way of signing the mid-level veterans, which we talked about in the last episode, where you squeeze the most value in your best bang for your buck. And, uh, again, Riley Reef starting three, four, five games next year, not the end of the world. But what are you getting out of Trent Brown? We don't know. It is a contract year. That's tend to be when uh, Trent Brown plays his best. But uh, we shall see. All right, two more. Caleb wants to know, do you think the Pats are done adding to the wide receiver room? If not, what moves could they make? Well, for agency market, uh, it's pretty barren. I think you still got guys like Braxton Berrios who are out there. Paris Campbell's kind of a rotational player. He's been thrown out there. And when you start digging at the bottom of the bin at Walmart for old DVDs or at Dollar Tree, like that's that's kind of where we are here. You know, you have some fits. Like if you find the Goonies down there for two bucks, I'm super excited. I just don't think you're going to get any of those type of movies. You're getting like Scary Movie 5 is where we're at down at the bottom of these bins, okay? Yeah, you might uh, – the, the players that you might get at this point um... – 
are the guys that, you know, there's that one game they have during the season. It's week four and they give you five catches in the second half and everybody goes gaga on Monday morning about oh, they might have found their, you know, their X or their Z, whatever. And then um, the next week he plays like four snaps. Yeah. And the coaching staff is telling you exactly what they think of him. It was nice that he gave us that performance. Christian Wilkerson, a few years ago, right? Gave them that two touchdown catch game against the Jags, who were historically awful. Um, and then everyone's like, they've developed a receiver. They got a guy. Did he catch another pass? Maybe by like two, the rest of his tenure. Yeah, he's in Indian. Indianapolis now. That's that says. Yeah, all yeah. He, that's all you need to know. Exactly. Now, uh, I'm still phoned down. I don't know about you, but I, I, I would think, Caleb, to, to be a little more direct, um, I think they will sign another receiver for agency, and I would not rule out Jackson and Jacob Smith from Ohio State for them at 14. I think he tested exceptionally. His tape, granted, it was from a year and a half ago, is terrific. That's another easy projection. And it's almost like as much as we all joke about the Patriots and their history of drafting receivers, you can't screw that up. Depending on who's there, would I do it, would I not, I don't know yet. But I think that's absolutely in play in light of how, you know, this has really played out and all indications I've gotten from people I've talked to pretty much out on Hopkins. And, and that's that's where we stand. Yeah, I've also heard that they're pretty much out on Hopkins. Uh, I would say I like Jackson Smith. Two years ago, he was one of the best players in college football. Um, but boy, his skill set. And the guy you just paid money for in free agency and Juju Smith-Schuster, there's a similarity there. They're both primarily slot guys. In fact, I think Jackson Smith has been a slot guy, period. End of story. You can move Juju to the outside, but it's not. he's not a guy who runs past people out there. He's going to be a 50-50 a guy, and you already have one of those in Devontae Parker. So, again, like what's the master plan there? That. You're going to draft the same guy and take two years to develop him. I mean, I know you can run those two players out there at the same time. It's not it's Edelman and, and, and Amendola were slot guys, right? Yes, Julian could play outside. Yes, you could throw Danny outside if you wanted to uh, with less success. But it just seems like, well, then why would you sign Juju if you wanted to draft a guy who basically has the same skill set? So I, I don't. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily love the, I like the fit a lot. I like the player a lot, but I just think you just signed the guy basically. So I, I don't know that that's odd to me. All right. We'll see. Uh, the last question is one we actually already answered and I alluded to is from Epry. Uh, why draft two running backs last year? Uh, assuming to replace Damon Harris when they spend money in James Robinson for agency. Again, they have more information than they did last year when they added Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris. Um, and they chose that James Robinson was probably the second best player if they added into the roster and they did. So I'll get to one more question since we answered that. Uh, do you think they replaced Devin McCourty in house as the next free safety? We mentioned Jonathan Jones could do it. Kyle Duggar and Adrian Phillips and Jabril Peppers. Peppers plays some real free safety for Cleveland. Granted, they shipped him off and out after two years. Yeah. Uh, and he's another one of these sometimes better in theory than in reality players who do everything. But I, I think they'll draft someone. Um, Julian Love, as far as I know, is still out there. Taylor Rapp, you just said, is visiting. So I'd give it a 50-50 shot. Yeah, I mean, I so if you I, – I kind of like the idea of John Jones or even Jalen Mills as the free safety. Now Jalen maybe doesn't have the same uh, top-end speed, but he's played safety before. You guys uh, know I play safety? Yes, you guys know exactly. I'm a hybrid, right? Yes. Yes. Actually, when they signed him, I thought that that was the I thought that was the way it was going to go. He was going to come. He was going to play corner for a year. Then Devin was going to leave and he was going to be Devin's replacement. Um, Devin stayed on longer than that. And now here we are. Um, yeah, I guess I'm 50 50 on it, but I, I think that they do have some in-house options um, that make sense. You know, if you tell me Marcus Jones is going to be your slot, if you really feel that, and I I think we all want to see Marcus on the field more, and I don't want to see Marcus on the outside very much because at 5'8", there's just – that's no. 5'8", and just short arms, by the way, short arms, um, where they, they kind of went away from their, their normal um, MO at corner last year with both drafting Jack Jones, who's skinny as can be, and Marcus with the short arms. Um, 
then yeah, where where are you putting where are you putting John? Is he going to play on the outside again? Is that the best use of him? Um, can you cobble together a couple guys at free safety? Can you alternate? Hey, it's going to be Jalen in certain situations. It's going to be John in certain situations. I don't know if that's necessarily best for both players. Uh, it would be nice to probably get to one position and stay there, but uh, I think they have in-house options if they want. Marcus with the short arms. I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear much after that because it just sounded like someone you're trying to name. And you're like, yeah, you know, Marcus with the short arms. I don't know why I didn't ask <laughs> Well, I, you know, I remember, I remember going through the, um, the reports last year. And I'm just like, I was shocked that when you look at all their corners over the course of time that they've drafted, even some of the un, undrafted free agents, like, I don't think anybody's even in the same like category with him in terms of the arm length. I was like, I know, but it sounds like they stop at his rib cage, Mike. Like he's down <laughs> here, and this this is where they are. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm one of those people you're... that like in general. I, I I think that we go too far with the numbers sometimes, and these little you know whatever the analytics and all these different things. Um, but arm length is actually something that I kind of have bought into over the course of time because. Mm -hmm we're an elite athlete and we're covering another elite athlete and the quarterback's an elite throw of the football and he puts the ball here and you're covering him, but your arm is just, it just, uh, if, I, if my arm was a half inch longer, I, I, got, I got my finger on the ball. And, you know, there, there was that play against uh, T Higgins where he's in great position to cover T Higgins. Now T Higgins is like what? Six, three, uh, can six, jump five. out of the building, but like, six, five. There was nothing he could do. And I there, there are guys that there's nothing. Maybe that's not a great example. But there are points in time where you're in position to make a play and you can't make the play strictly because you don't have the arm length. I just... I need to rename this video for the folks on YouTube to Mike Giardi's one-on-one clinic on how passing works. <laughs> See the, I, was, I was trying to get smaller and then hands and just get, to, you know, get the arm. I don't know. Look, I, I, I agree with you to an extent. Um, I think, you know, it, it also helps uh, if you're 5'10 or 6 foot rather than the 5'8 having longer arms. Um, but that's that's for another day. Anyway, they've got options. I think they need to get bigger corners still. And, uh, we'll see what they do there. But Jonathan Jones is back. I think most of our grades were actually fairly kind uh, for the free agency hall. They just need to do a little bit more. The good news is yes. they have the cap. They have the cash and they have us to lean on. You know, honestly, if the front office wants to make a call more than just, you know, heads up about this happening or just kind of, you know, shoot the shit. Um, we, we've got plenty of opinions and we've uh, unspooled them here for the last hour. So yeah, he's I'm Mike sure, Giardi, sure, the NFL I'm Network. Sure, I'm sure this Matt podcast. Gross. I'm yeah, sure Matt you're still so phoned down. Yeah. I just saw your yeah. screen. What a guy. Yeah. Um, nothing new. I'm phoned up now. I, I bailed yeah. on you like yeah. 10 minutes ago. But uh, tight. when, uh, how do you want, do you want some time off before I, before I bug you again to come back? uh what do we got we got draft in um five you're weeks? still skipping ahead to draft we have the tournament we could talk about we could we're going to do owners meetings breakdown we're going to do draft previews the draft is going to happen i'm going to do another report card in the draft then i'm going to get married what sort of nonsense is going to come out of the owners meeting i i i don't i i'm not going so i i couldn't tell you but karen Gregan will fill us in when that happens all right i gotta yeah, go i think, Ju you I think to judy turn your phone will up. be there and i'll just i'll talk to judy and she'll she'll tell me what's up perfect she's a better hang than me anyway so yeah. uh this episode of fast interference <laughs> podcast brought to you by fanduel the exclusive wagering partner of the clns media network sign up now at fanduel.com slash boston and claim i'm not kidding your 200 dollars bonus thank you mike thanks sir